As an island nation, Britain has been separated from mainland Europe for over 8,000 years. Throughout the centuries, ships have sailed across the English Channel and the North and Irish Seas to invade, settle, or trade. But many have been lost to reefs, storms, piracy, and war. These shipwrecks span centuries in time, from the Bronze Age through to the 20th century. Each one is different, and each has a story to tell about England's rich maritime history. To protect nationally important historic shipwrecks, the British government passed the Protection of Wrecks Act in 1973. This allows restricted areas to be designated around significant wrecks. By 2023, 57 shipwrecks were receiving vital protection from historic England through a licensing system of custodians. They work as volunteers to monitor sites, research wrecks, and bring them alive for everyone. On the 8th of January, 1749, the Amsterdam, a ship of the Dutch East India Company, set out fully laden on her maiden voyage to Batavia in the East Indies. Battling severe gales, she attempted to sail down the English Channel, but with many of the crew already dead or dying from an epidemic, the survivors mutinied and drove the ship onto the beach to escape. 230 years later, the rediscovery of the wreck was one of several events which kick-started the Protection of Wrecks Act. Archaeologist Dr. Peter Marsden became involved. Contractors building a sewer outfall in 1969 found that they were operating on the site of this wreck. And so they used their machines to dig into the wreck and they found bottles of wine, bronze guns and so on. Wonderful things. Rex Cowan lawyer, author, and wreck researcher, watched these developments with increasing alarm. Because the Amsterdam contains a complete cargo, virtually untouched from the main deck downwards, you know, and uh, was there visually. And it had an exciting story, as well as a story of modern pillage, because, of course, a lot of people tried to dig into the Amsterdam, they stole cannon, they stole all sorts of things out of it. It was chaotic and uh, destructive. Oh dear, it really was. Um, uh, I suppose like the Wild West. It was anything went. And, oh boy, if ever there was a need for a law to recognise historic wrecks as uh, part of our heritage, this was it. There should be some sort of reining in, some sort of legislation to stop what was uh, highway robbery. It was treated purely as salvage on one hand. I came in saying, hey, this is history and it should be a historic site and it should be protected. The authorities were powerless to act and to protect these national treasures, something had to be done. Certain elements of the public didn't really like the whole idea of uh, history becoming swag. And so a group of us archaeologists got together and we pushed like mad for a law which recognised historic wrecks as part of our heritage. And the Minister for Transport uh, agreed to draft the Protection of Wrecks Act. And when that came in, in 1973, it uh, at last gave protection and the legal status to historic wrecks. It has opened up a world of things and people and places and techniques and the richness of history that you can 
not find completely by in books or reading, but the things themselves. Relatively few people get the chance to dive on historic shipwrecks, but here on this beach, anyone can step back centuries in nautical time. These rare opportunities, during the lowest spring tides when the Amsterdam is revealed, serve as powerful testament to the nation's maritime past. Lost in 1757 in the eastern Solent Channel lies the wreck of a ship which radically changed the design of warships up to and beyond the Battle of Trafalgar. Maritime archaeologist and current licensee is Dr. Dan Pascoe. Well, I can't quite believe it, but I've been diving in protected wreck sites for nearly half my life. I've been a licensee for, I think, 13 years now. I just love it. It's my job and it's what I do for my hobby. And it's just brilliant. It's taken me all over the UK. But my favourite has to be on the south coast in the Solent, where HMS Invincible lies on horsetail side. So much of it survives. It's probably the best preserved mid 18th century warship in the UK. It's preserved from the stern to the bow, from the gun deck down to the floor of ship on the port side. And then the starboard side, that survives too, but in four huge chunks that have broken away from the port side and lie separated just to the north. But if you were to piece it all together, nearly 75% of the ship survives. The Orlock deck was the most incredible part of the ship. I mean, the Orlock deck is where the storerooms are. And on the side of the hull, we had shelves that were just stacked full of artifacts still. Um, we think we found the bosun's storeroom because it had all sorts from um, equipment that was used for kind of just keeping the ship clean. So, Bossom brushes, like a witch's broom. We had a wooden staved bucket. We found a wonderful sand glass, possibly a 14 second sand glass that was used for uh, measuring the ship's speed. Now the Invincible was one of the fastest ships in the fleet and she was the only ship to have this 14 second sand glass. No other ship was fast enough. The French developed this new warship, 70-gun warship, uh, in the 1740s. And the British, through Admiral Anson, captured Invincible. And Anson realised this was the future of warship design. It took about 10 years to persuade the Navy to start building ships just like Invincible. And eventually they did. And the 74-gun ship went on to become the backbone of the British Navy and all of the most powerful navies in the world. And by the time of the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, so nearly 50 years after Invincible was captured, 50% of the ships on all sides were the 74 gun ships. So they really were the workhorse of all of the most powerful navies in the world. The two most important people when it comes to the wreck of HMS Invincible is Arthur Mack, the fisherman that found it and John Bingaman, who Arthur teamed up with to investigate the site and excavate it during the 1980s and early 1990s. When John was celebrating his 60th anniversary of diving, we took him out on the Invincible. And it was just brilliant swimming around the wreck with John. We came across this area that had just uncovered and there was like staves of barrels and planks just sort of coming out uh, of the sand in really good condition. And we were both in there trying to just carefully um, hand fan to see what else was there. And we, it, you could just see the excitement in his eyes. It was very important that I uh, continued the work that John did, but also Arthur Mack. And I really wanted his blessing to carry on working on, working on the site because I knew it, it meant so much to him and, and his team. So they were doing these amazing things, um, not only diving it, but showing off the artifacts. And how can that not inspire anyone? That's exactly what I wanted to do. And I just wanted to carry on their amazing work.
HMS A1, the Royal Navy's first all-British designed and built submarine, was launched in 1902 in Barrow-in-Furness. Ten years later, she was lost whilst undergoing naval trials between Chichester and the Isle of Wight. In 1989, a local fisherman snagged his nets on the hull of this uncharted wreck, and local diver Martin Woodward was asked to investigate. At first it was thought that it might possibly have been a Holland-class submarine, because the Holland 5 was lost some way to the east. When we looked at it, obviously the conning tower features and everything else pointed to it being an A-class submarine, and obviously coming back to uh, look at the records, it was quite easily identifiable, and then uh, correlating that to the loss of the A1. And we looked around for something that would definitely identify the wreck. One identifying feature I've got is like a flag holding uh, device. I found it on the seabed and that really confirmed the identity of the submarine. Before you go down it's an, an obstruction that someone's caught up in with their net and you're thinking on the way down, as you go down that line, I mean, the visibility was pretty bad the first time. Uh, you're thinking, I wonder what it is. Is it going to be exciting? Is it going to be old? Is it going to be this century? Is it going to be two centuries old? Whatever. So you never, ever lose that, that buzz. Um, I, I mean, I've dived on literally hundreds of wrecks, but I never lose that buzz of not knowing when you're entering the time capsule what you're going to find. Such is the importance of this submarine, it was designated in 1998. A dive team of volunteers, led by Martin Davis, regularly visit the site. Being the first British designed and built submarine, it's just, it's just an amazing feat of engineering. And to see it still almost in one piece there, out, out, you know, just out here in the Solent, it's just, it's just truly amazing. And I really get so excited about diving it each time. It's, it's just a fantastic dive that anyone can do. You know, it's geared only at 14 metres deep, and yet anybody in the world can got a diving qualification can come and dive it with me. And I really enjoy um, chaperoning people around it and giving them the history about it, because it truly is just an amazing feat of engineering. It's 120 years old now, and still actually truly looks like a submarine in a lot better condition than a lot of wooden wrecks. So our dive team mainly comprises of volunteers here from South Sea Sawaka Club. We're diving the wreck about a dozen times a year. Uh, this involves uh, initially just doing some monitoring of the wreck and making sure that it's in good condition. If there's actually damage to the wreck, then we'll organise removal of ropes and pots. Um, we'll also start looking at some of the sediment on the wreck and the wildlife on the wreck as well, which is really important. Illegal potting on the wreck is quite disturbing really because the damage that it can cause and more recently in the last two years we've had some serious damage to the hull so it's quite disappointing to see it. I learnt a lot of the skills that I've got now from the Nautical Archaeological Society. They're based here down in Portsmouth and it was really handy just in the early years of wanting to dive the wreck but actually not knowing truly what I could do and what I needed to do. And so I got in touch with the Nautical Archaeological Society and they, um, they instantly put me into some courses and I learnt some skills very quickly about underwater archaeology, which was absolutely fantastic. So it's been a really rewarding experience being a licensee. Uh, I've stuck at it for 18 years and I think the rewards really of actually seeing the wreck, keeping an eye on it, keeping it as protected as we can do, reporting incidences to historic England and being a chaperone for many people and passing on that knowledge of one of our first British designed and built submarines. Unless you're very lucky, Finding an undiscovered wreck usually involves painstaking research and hours spent underwater. And rarely do you find a shipwreck of international significance. But in the mid-1990s, Ron Howell and his dive team did. 
just that. On the Sunday we, uh, we went in, I was one of two divers and chose a gully to go down and bingo, found a gold ingot. And, um, and um, <clears throat> the sweep of the hand at coins and jewellery appeared. I went for my friend or my buddy, dive buddy. The heart was going 10 to the dozen. I pointed to my hands and uh, he looked amazed. I told him to search around where I would have been. I had to go up top because I was running out of air. So I draped both my hands over the uh, side of the boat, went like that, and gold just tipped into the bottom of the boat. And, well, that was an experience and a half. Several ships, some dating back to the Bronze Age, have been lost in this bay. While these wrecks have long since decayed, their cargoes of metalwork and ingots remain. These unique finds have reshaped our understanding of Bronze Age trade in Europe, as well as taught us more about an important 17th century wreck. We'd uh, just found uh, what was possibly a, a galleon, and then we started to find tin ingots. Uh, we realised that uh, it was very important, and so we uh, applied for designation and we got it. Lying so close to the shore, the wreck site was highly vulnerable to disturbance and looting. The Southwest Maritime Archaeological Group has set up the first ever site security scheme. This has become the model for other underwater heritage watch schemes around England. So we realised the importance of protection, so we set up a protection. So every boat that goes out there needs to have a call sign, uh, how long on the dive site, when they leave the dive site, so, and it's worked. Uh, after working hard every weekend for the last 22 years, it's nice to know you can leave the site and it's not going to be looted because we have had problems. Artifacts from different wrecks and different periods of time are lying close to each other, creating a puzzle for archaeologists. I think this site here has only just started. We found two Bronze Age wrecks, a cannon site and a catch and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Those early dives that led to over two decades of exploration are continuing today with new volunteer divers signing up to help expand the search area. And what I've learnt from diving on the, this protected wreck out there and all my colleagues uh, is tremendous. We've basically become historians, uh, we've be we become probably professors in, ge in geography, everything. Uh, it's just been an incredible journey. It's so important to keep these sites going. In 1740, the Roosweik, a Dutch East Indiaman, was outward bound from Holland. Fully laden with silver ingots, coins and general cargo, she was lost in a storm with all hands and was driven onto the treacherous Goodwin Sands known to mariners as the Great Ship Swallower. The Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands worked with Historic England to undertake the project, and Mark James is overseeing the survey and commercial diving operation on this protected site. The wreck of the Ruswick was found by a local diver, Ken Welling, who spent a number of years in the archives and undertaking magnetometer survey and diving targets on the Goodwin Sands to try and find this wreck. He eventually located it and, and dived it and, and understood what he had on the seabed here. It's without divers like Ken, the majority of these protected wreck sites would not be found. As Britain was an important maritime trading country, wrecks of ships from many other nations could be found around the coast. The Ruswick is part of our shared cultural heritage with Europe. It is a Dutch vessel that sank in English waters, so there's responsibilities for the Dutch to manage the site and for the English to manage the site as well. From 2016 to 2018, I've been managing the, the UK um, side of the excavation project on the Ruswick, from working on uh, a smaller vessel undertaking a pre-excavation um, assessment right the way through to 2017, 2018, where we worked on two different vessels. It's been a, a large scale project involving divers from, from both the, the UK and the Netherlands. Excavating a shipwreck three miles offshore in strong currents and limited visibility is taking maritime archaeology to another level of complexity.
The excavation of the Ruswick was primarily undertaken by a large-scale professional archaeological team and some of this had to do with the diving techniques that we needed to use on site. However, we're very conscious that sites such as these can present wonderful opportunities for, for volunteers to get involved. So we ran um, open days on the site where we encouraged divers to come and see what we were doing and, and how the project was working. We built in volunteering opportunities back at our shoreside conservation facility. And even in the, the post-excavation conservation side of the project, we have volunteers continuing to work and help conserve the artifacts for us. My role overseeing the diving operations on, on the Ruswick project has meant that I've been on the vessel at all times. And when we see some of these phenomenal artefacts come to the surface for the first time since the ship has sunk, it, it's an experience that, that can't be beat. The uncovering of these objects, dating back nearly 300 years, provides valuable insights into how the crew lived and worked. I just come back from my uh, third dive on the Roosweig. And there I excavated this beautiful light. And at first, all I could find was the bottom part. And I didn't know what it was, so I started excavating slowly around it, excavating more and more. And then it turned out that it was not going in too deep in the sand. And I flipped it over underwater and could see this beautiful light. And when I got back to the surface, uh, showed it to the other archaeologist and there then showed me this handle and it fitted perfectly. So beautiful light. Lying partially buried in Studland Bay off the Jurassic coast, it's the oldest wreck in England where part of the vessel still survives. I'm Tom Cousins, I'm a maritime archaeologist at Bournemouth University and I'm also the licensee of three protected wrecks just out here. We've got the Studland Bay, the Swash Channel and our latest one is the 13th century water wreck. So we've known for years that there's been something here and we've always been told it's just a big pile of stones. We had a bit of time left at another project working on the other protected wrecks in the area. We decided to check it out. Uh, we came across a big pile of stones, but then when we looked beyond it, we started seeing all of these mortars, like mortar and pestles, made out of Purbeck marble. Uh, and they're a specific type of grinding for grinding up all your food. And about two thirds of all the mortars found in the UK are, were made and carved here in Purbeck. So it's a huge export for the area, massive import, one of the most important tools in every medieval kitchen. So we have those and that's how the wreck got its name because we have over 30 just on this surface when we first dived it. And then we started seeing timbers, clinker timbers that show this is a really old significant wreck. Those timbers from the wreck from Irish forests date from about 1240 to 1270. And one of the things, although it's an Irish forest, it's from the same timber from Salisbury Cathedral. So they would have cut down the trees to Salisbury Cathedral. Some of them went into the cathedral and some of them went into building a ship. So this is probably a much larger ship than we thought, about 24 metres long, and it's the type of ship you see on the medieval ship seals, because it's medieval 13th century, it's pre-Black Death, it's pre-industrialisation. And this is one of the oldest wrecks we have in the UK. And when we returned the next year to excavate, that's when we started finding things like the grave slabs, and they are immaculate. You can still see the chisel marks on them for the day. Um, and they were like they were carved yesterday, but they are 800 years old. Even as licensees, we can't just go down and pick stuff up. We have to have a plan, a conservation plan, and a museum for it to go into. Any work on this site has to be done for the benefit of the country and the world the wider world, but it has to be done for the benefit. It can't just be for, I want something on a mantelpiece. It's, this is gonna go into a museum. This is gonna be a big display. Because this is carrying a cargo of stone, used to build all the abbeys, all the religious buildings, cathedrals. Westminster Abbey, for example, is being built heavily out of Purbeck marble. Canterbury Cathedral's got a lot of Purbeck stone in there. So this stone is massive medieval industry. 
and this is the only evidence we've really got between the quarry and it appearing in the monasteries and in the cathedrals. It's always been a bit of a, well, what happened between the two? And now we've got how it was transported, what type of mixed cargo is going to be on board, all this other stuff we can start learning from this about life as seen in the Middle Ages. It was very, very exciting and very to seeing the site and researching all the finds that we were finding. So with my work at Bournemouth University, I'm trying to encourage the next generation of divers and archaeologists into searching this area for our maritime history. We've got everything from the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, Roman, onwards. We know is in this bay somewhere, and we've just got to go out there and find it. Even sites like the Mortarek we've known about for years, they just needed someone to go down and look at it to actually say, oh, this is actually something significant. So there's always stuff out here to discover every day and get that next generation into diving, searching, and doing the research for the archaeology of Paul Harbour and of the UK and, as a ship, the wider world in general. Many people are familiar with the Mary Rose, the flagship of Henry VIII's Navy, which sank in the Solent Channel in 1545, whilst fighting an invading French fleet. Although its sinking was a disaster with over 600 men lost, in archaeological terms, it was a gift, a time capsule of Tudor artifacts. Rediscovered in 1971, the bulk of the hull was fully excavated and raised in 1982. As Britain's most important maritime archaeology project, she is now on display for the nation in the historic dockyard at Portsmouth. And since a substantial part of the Mary Rose remains buried on the seabed, it is still designated as a protected shipwreck. Dr. Alex Hildred has been involved for over four decades in the excavation, conservation and display of the Mary Rose. When I first dived on the Mary Rose in 1979, I had no idea that I would still be part of this wonderful project so many years later. As we were excavating the wreck, we could actually see she was degrading. To actually empty the entire wreck and lift it required 85 dives a day sometime with 45 different divers. We had 11 airlifts working on either side of the wreck, and then you'd have survey people coming in when the tide wasn't running enough to excavate. So the sheer size of the operation could not have happened without volunteer divers. The protection of Rex Act, I think, has been absolutely vital to the Mary Rose. If she hadn't been protected, a number of things could have happened. There could have been divers who, who came and worked on the site without us knowing about it and taking objects, excavating objects, interfering with it. There could have been more fishing impact. So I think the Protection of Rex Act, which allowed our team to work the Mary Rose, was really important because that meant everything got kept together and we've got, you know, register of objects going back. Now we can back trade it down, down to 1971 when the first objects was fo were found. And I don't think you could have done what we did in lifting the in excavating and lifting the ship without something like the Protection of Rex Act, which boldly told people that you know, they couldn't go into the area of the site with things like buoys or things like signage on the beach and, and the notice to mariners and the advice on charts, etc. So it helped a lot. We have over 19,000 artifacts recovered from the Mary Rose. That excludes timbers, samples, human remains. And all of them have got a wonderful meaning. It's, a cradle, if you like, for all of these objects which give you a slice of Tudor time. And you can look at it and you can visualise the objects and you can try and understand it in a way that you, you can't do just by reading through history books or looking at paintings. I mean, things like the chest full of longbows, so 50 longbows in a chest in storage or up ready to be taken to the castle deck. Absolutely amazing, opening the chest and seeing the different colours of the yew, longbows, those are wonderful. But things like tiny maple wood spoon, a beautifully carved spoon. Or even some of the combs, we've got about 80 combs, mostly made of boxwood. And they're just like the knit combs that you would use on your family today. Shoes, you know, how personal are those belongings? These things, how did they get into the Mary Rose? Who did they belong to?
One of my favorites is the gun, which was the first thing that I touched, and that's one of the most beautifully decorated bronze guns that we've got, so that's got a special part of my heart with it. The fact that I was one of those people who, between 1979 and 1982, helped with the excavation is just amazing. And this is happening all over the country, the potential for people to join teams that, that will change their lives. One of the earliest divers on the Mary Rose was the then Prince of Wales. To this day, as King Charles III, he continues to endorse the vital role volunteers play. Volunteering is a most commendable initiative and the dedication displayed by those who offer their time to support charitable causes is truly admirable. The efforts and contributions made to safeguard historic wrecks for future generations around the coast of the United Kingdom are deeply appreciated by the King. The interest in uncovering and learning from our past has never been greater, and around the coastline of England, there are many more shipwrecks still to be discovered. All the wrecks still have so many stories and secrets to reveal, so we need a new generation of enthusiasts who are able to tell those stories, to illuminate the past. You know, without ordinary volunteer divers, we wouldn't have found out half of what we found about what is underwater, never mind be able to identify the important wrecks that need protection. At Historic England, we don't have the resources to keep an eye on these sites throughout the year. There's 57 protected wrecks sites around the coast of England, and so having locally based licensees who are able to uh, monitor the sites, get out of there, make the use of the best weather opportunities is incredibly important. Without volunteer divers, I don't think we would be half as far along the archaeological and underwater cultural heritage route as we are at the moment. A diverse maritime landscape with thousands of years of history, from prehistory through to present day, really, the diversity is represented in the range of protected wreck sites, from Bronze Age sites through to 15th century ships to 20th century submarines. There's really something for everyone, just depends on what you're interested in. We need to get, you know, the next generation I'm not only interested in diving the 57 sites that exist now, but to find another 57 sites. Because we're in the UK, there are thousands of shipwrecks, really significant shipwrecks. And the more shipwrecks that are protected, the more important maritime archaeology is. And we really need to make our maritime archaeology important in the UK, make these shipwrecks visible so everyone can appreciate them.